Wednesday, April 3rd, 1974, Cleveland, Tennessee. It is early afternoon in southeastern Tennessee. The early days of spring have brought unseasonably hot and muggy weather to the Great Appalachian Valley. Residents know all too well what this type of weather usually brings in the late afternoon. And so do forecasters, having implemented thunderstorm watches that morning. But little did any of them expect the scope of what was about to unfold. At 2 p.m. local time, to the south of town, a supercell thunderstorm plants a tornado in the East View neighborhood. 100 injuries and a fatality were reported with the storm. This F3 tornado would be the first significant tornado of what was about to become the most impactful day in United States tornado history. Over the next 18 hours, a staggering additional 143 tornadoes would reach the ground across the region, spanning from the jungle of southern Mississippi to the lowlands of southern Ontario. The human impact was devastating, but the economic and sheer amount of area affected made this event simply unprecedented, cementing April 3rd, 1974, not only as a tornado outbreak, but the super outbreak. The super outbreak story starts 48 hours earlier, as the evolution of the weather system began to take shape. Cyclogenesis off of the Rocky Mountains was driven by a massive trough in the jet stream overhead, drawing the primed Gulf air over the Tennessee and Ohio valleys. An overnight elevated storm complex would progress through this region on the 2nd. This would weaken capping that would normally prevent storms and bolster wind shear profiles that would support strong supercell thunderstorms, setting the stage for the main show that afternoon of April 3rd. And sure enough, surface-based supercells would fire off in two lines, one over central Illinois and the other over the Ohio Valley. At 2.20 p.m. local time, the first historic tornado would plant itself west of Leopold, Indiana. Most of its 68-mile-long track was over rural areas before steamrolling the communities of DuPont, Martinsburg, and Daisy Hill, where farms, a school, and dozens of homes were hit. This would mark the first of seven F5 tornadoes that day. For context, an F5 is the highest category a tornado can be, considered to be incredible damage. At this moment in time, only select tornado scientists and individuals in the weather service knew what an F5 really meant. That would all change after April 3rd, but that explanation will have to wait. Almost simultaneously with the DuPont tornado, 30 miles south is Irvington, Kentucky, where the second F5 of the event is starting to make its way northward turning towards a city along the Ohio River named Brandenburg. The western half of town would be hit with vicious force, shredding nearly everything above ground and throwing it into the mighty river. Numerous well-constructed anchored structures completely obliterated with little evidence of their prior existence, driving many to consider this F5 possibly the strongest of the event. In Brandenburg alone, 28 lives were taken, and another 250 were seriously injured. Back to the north, the supercell responsible for the first F5 had cycled and was dropping its next tornado. This F4 would wipe away a major portion of Hanover, Indiana, but miraculously, no fatalities took place within the town's limits. Just upstream was Madison, where the same could not be said, as 11 lives were claimed by this tornado. Even though this supercell had yet to perform its encore, 100 miles northeast of Madison, a completely different supercell had spawned yet another F5. This one, however, is squarely aimed at the city of Xenia, Ohio. This tornado was of multi-vortex nature, with the parent circulation spanning nearly a half mile wide. It hit Xenia dead center, flattening the subdivision of Windsor Park before slamming the high school. Students in after-school activities lay in the hallways moments before impact. A school bus would be launched into the auditorium. Multiple residents captured the tornado on film, resulting in some of the most famous tornado images in history. Past Xenia, the towns of Wilberforce and Cedarville would also be impacted. By tornado's end, 
Over 1,400 homes and businesses were destroyed, 1,000 were injured, and 32 people perished. Back over the Ohio River to the west of Cincinnati, the same storm that spawned the DuPont and Madison tornadoes produced the fourth F5 of the day. It crossed state lines from Kentucky into Ohio, and upon crossing the river, the twister crashed into the Bankside neighborhood of Sailor Park, Cincinnati. It would flip a floating restaurant barge, and homes built to withstand river flooding were slabbed with ease, some of which were thrown into the Ohio. Thousands of Cincinnati residents watched the tornado live on TV as it traversed the western city limits. Despite impacting the Cincinnati Metro, only three fatalities occurred in the fourth F5. Well to the north, one of the cyclical supercells from the Illinois Initiation Region spins up its seventh tornado. The city of Monticello, Indiana would be hit head-on by the F4, destroying the county courthouse and 40 other structures. The Penn Central Railroad Bridge over the Tippecanoe River would also be heavily damaged. The F4 was far from over though, as the communities of Rochester and Talma would be also hit head-on. By the end of this remarkable F4, Another 18 lives were lost alongside another 285 injuries. As the afternoon turned to evening, the threat would transition further south into the Tennessee Valley. Supercells fired east of the lower Mississippi River in the late afternoon. At 6.15 p.m. to the west of Moulton, Alabama, yet another F5 rated tornado would find its way to the ground. Just north of town, multiple homes were completely swept away, and even a water pump was pulled out of its well house. Debris was granulated beyond recognition as the tornado traversed towards the Tennessee River. The tornado would begin to trench on the other side of the river, plastering debarked trees with earth. This F5 would run through the south side of Tanner, Alabama, where mobile homes did not stand a chance. First responders in Tanner rush to the affected areas to assist the wounded when the unthinkable happens. Yet another tornado touches down to the southwest of town and in a deadly one-two punch plows through the center of Tanner. For the second time in 30 minutes, Tanner has been hit by an F5 tornado. Folks injured in the first tornado that were brought into town were now subjected to their second F5. Whatever was spared in the first Tanner tornado was taken care of by the second. Between the two Tanner F5s, 44 fatalities and 457 injuries occurred, the majority of which were in the devastated community of Tanner. Congruently with the second Tanner F5, the supercell that had dropped the first Tanner tornado would produce an F4 that would rip through the communities of Harmony Hill and Pleasant Ridge, Tennessee. 46 homes and 90 barns would be added to the day's tally, alongside the lives of 11 and 121 more injuries. As day transitioned to night, an enhanced low-level jet would supercharge a late storm crossing from Mississippi into Alabama. This supercell would spawn a tornado over Caledonia, Mississippi, where it would quickly cross into Alabama. Passing north of Vernon, it screamed northeastward towards the town of Gouin. Shrouded by the night, Gwyn would be subjected to arguably the most violent tornado of the event, and potentially in all of recorded history. A mobile home production plant was slabbed, its twisted steel skeleton thrown downstream. Brick residential homes were not only slabbed, but their foundations themselves were either moved or in some cases also completely swept away. More catastrophic damage occurred 23 miles upstream in Del Mar, where the now mile-wide nocturnal wedge would wrap mobile homes around debarked tree trunks. This F5 would mow through the Bankhead National Forest, tossing trees like toothpicks before roping out 103 miles from its origin, just south of Decatur, Alabama. The final tally for the seventh and final F5 of the day would be 546 flattened structures. Injuries to 272 individuals and 28 fatalities. So far, we've recounted the cliff notes of 10 major tornadoes from this outbreak. However, this is just a fraction of the total story, as the day's final totals are overwhelming. 
Between April 3rd and 4th, 1974, a total of 148 individual tornado swaths added up to an astonishing 2,600 miles of destruction. Human impacts were vast, as there were over 5,400 severe injuries recorded. On top of that, a tragic loss of 310 people. The final damage assessments accrued to an estimated 843 million a whopping 5.3 billion when adjusted for inflation. To come up with that damage figure, it was thanks in large part to one particularly zealous tornado scientist. Evaluation of this disaster was unlike anything seen in prior weather history, but for Dr. Ted Fujita, this was the type of event he dreamed of. He scrambled to put together air crews and survey teams while tornadoes were still in progress the night of the third. Time was of the essence as the cleanup of Fujita's precious evidence would most certainly begin at sunrise on the 4th. Single-engine aircraft darted over hundreds of miles of damage to photograph the tornado tracks. Ground crews spearheaded by NWS employees and meteorology grad students captured detailed images of the damage and surveyed survivors to obtain as much information as possible about each tornado and their actions that saved their lives. With a massive mound of evidence gathered, Fujita and his team sifted through it all at the University of Chicago. Over the next year, he put together the most detailed and comprehensive tornado outbreak survey to date. This event would be the first ever wide-scale implementation of Fujita scale, the scale nobody outside of the meteorology world knew of at this point. 34 tornadoes were assigned in F2, 34 in F3, 23 in F4, and 7, the distinction of an F5. This meant 98 of the 148 tornadoes that day were significant damage producers, a figure completely unprecedented in tornado history up until then. In the wake of April 3rd, while communities picked up the pieces and started the long road to recovery, the wheels of Capitol Hill started to turn to change disaster response. Congress expedited the unanimously passed Disaster Relief Act of 1974. Most notably in this act was the action to create an agency that would coordinate disaster response, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, better known as FEMA that we know today. When all metrics are considered, the 1974 super outbreak was the most impactful tornado outbreak in American history. Its impact is forever cemented in dozens of towns dotted across the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. While its unprecedented impact was undoubtedly devastating, it forever changed tornado science and also set the wheels in motion on Capitol Hill to cause change in disaster response for the better. For 37 of the past 50 years, it seemed unquestionable that the super outbreak was a once in a lifetime event. In 2011, however, that would cease to be the case. But that's a story for another day. I'm Ethan Moriarty, and as always, stay safe out there when it comes to severe weather.